Mother died today, or maybe yesterday. I can't be sure. Have you ever got the sense that you are fundamentally alienated from other people? That despite all your attempts to connect, you cannot find someone you have a real companionship with? No matter what you do and no matter how hard you try, there is always some barrier that separates you from other people. You seem to be different, but not in a way that sparks joy or pride, but instead one that just makes you feel terrifyingly alone. I would wager that many of us have experienced this isolation in smaller or greater doses. And nowhere is this feeling articulated better than in Albert Camus' landmark novel, The Stranger. I've referenced it before on this channel in the context of absurdism, but today I want to tackle it from a different angle. I want to look at what the protagonist's experience of being an outsider can tell us about our own lives, and how we might slowly learn to make peace with this creeping feeling of being totally alone in the universe. Get ready to learn how philosophy can make you isolated, how those that don't understand you can become cruel and heartless, and so much more. Bear in mind that this is such a notoriously rich text that I will only be able to cover a fraction of its true depth here. And you can check out my other video on absurdism if you want some greater historical context. But without further ado, let's look at the foundational property of our protagonist. The one that both sets him apart from everybody else and eventually spells his doom. 1. Indifference and Difference the first half of The Stranger follows our hero, Merceau, as he goes about his daily life in French Algeria. The book opens with him burying his recently deceased mother, before pivoting to a series of vignettes where he interacts with Marie, his mistress, Raymond, a violent criminal, and Salamano, a very old man with an incredibly sick dog. And the extraordinary thing about Merceau, the thing that alienates him from the rest of society, even at this early stage, is his total indifference to everything that other people care about. This manifests in every faucet of his life. But perhaps the most prominent way it is displayed is not in anything Merceau outright says or does in the novel, but instead in the way Camus uses language throughout the text. Merceau's inner monologue is remarkably matter-of-fact. He will describe seemingly pointless details like the heat of the sun, alongside what most people would consider far more important matters, like outright threats to his life. Merceau sees the entire world as if it is through a grey filter. Nothing is ever that great or that bad. It is all in different shades of indifference. In other words, everything matters roughly the same amount to him, which is to say, not at all. For instance, in his romantic relationship with Marie, he finds great enjoyment in her company and is clearly incredibly attracted to her. In all respects, he seems emotionally invested in their budding relationship. But when she outright asks him if he loves her, he replies that it doesn't mean anything either way, but he doesn't think so. The particular way Camus puts this is vital. It is not just that Merceau does not love Marie, it is that he does not value love itself. But this is also not the spiteful rebellion against love that we see in some other stories. Merceau is not kicking his feet against romance, nor is he lying to project some pseudo-stoic image. It is as simple and honest as he says. He just doesn't think it matters. This phenomenon, which almost everyone else seems to hold in high esteem, strikes Merceau as pointless. Combined with Merceau's remark that his mother's passing has not really changed anything, this provides a valuable insight into his character. When it comes to personal relationships, a pillar of what most people think makes their lives meaningful, he is deeply indifferent. And his ambivalence does not stop there. We have already mentioned Raymond, the unsavoury character Merceau becomes friends with. Near the beginning of the novel, Raymond tells Merceau to write a note in order to lure one of his old girlfriends back to his flat, for the express purpose of berating, humiliating and possibly beating her. Surprisingly, for the supposed hero of our story, Merceau agrees, but it is not with conspiratorial glee, but again with calm indifference. He condemns a woman to violence with a shrug of his shoulders. He does not mind whether Raymond attacks this woman or not. The whole moral matter strikes him as a triviality. The fact that Raymond is violent and cruel does not concern him. He certainly doesn't see it as a positive, but he doesn't see it as a negative either. This gels rather well with something Merceau says later in the novel about being unable to feel remorse. Again, it is not that he is deliberately immoral or malicious, he's certainly not outright cruel, but morality is just another thing he doesn't particularly value. To him, it is as strange as some people would view my habit of collecting hardback books, or one of my good friend's obsession with Lego. This is the first brick in the wall between himself and others. Merceau may not call himself a philosopher, but he has seen the lack of objective value in the world, and this has seeped deep into his psyche. 
He thus holds the world and everyone else in it at a distance. In effect, he has very little in common with almost everyone around him. They are still enmeshed in their social roles, their sets of values, and their ideas of right and wrong. He just can't bring himself to care about any of this. This does not make him particularly sad or particularly happy, but it does cut him off from relating to and forging bonds with other people, and it sets him apart from the whole rest of his society. It is what makes him a stranger to everyone. And while we might not fully relate to Marceau's position of valuing basically nothing, many of us will be familiar with this sudden feeling of alienation, of seeing yourself in the third person or the world suddenly striking us as completely mundane. We might be sitting in a coffee shop or at work or chatting with friends, when in an instant we become painfully aware of the sheer pointlessness of it all. Our life ceases to feel like a hero's journey and instead becomes a hamster wheel. At that moment, it feels like we're observing ourselves from afar. And whatever we're doing starts to feel bizarre. Why am I doing this, we ask, and we cannot find a satisfactory answer. The people around us transform from warm, familiar faces we can relate to, to unconvincing masks placed atop mysterious, unknown thoughts. We become acutely aware of the brevity of our lives, the meaninglessness of our daily existence, and our ultimate solitude in a universe that does not care about us and could not even if it tried. And we look around at everyone else, wondering if they are thinking the same thing. In Camus' terminology, we have caught a glimpse of the absurd, the fact that despite our longing, there is no meaning out in the universe. For many of us, the sighting will be brief, and we will eventually fall back into the unconscious habits of our everyday lives. But what makes Merceau so remarkable is that he does not do this. Having come to realize that everything is pointless, he nonetheless continues to live. But this personal philosophy marks him out as different and isolated and alone. And if there is one thing that people don't take kindly to, it is this sort of difference. If you want to help me make more videos like this, then please consider subscribing to my channel or my Patreon. The links are in the description. 2. Judgment and Condemnation The second half of Camus' novel is dominated by Merceau's trial. Essentially, Raymond's developed a rivalry with another man, the brother of the woman that he was so cruel to at the beginning of the book. Raymond and Merceau go on a beach excursion, and while they are out, they encounter this man and some friends, and they become involved in a physical altercation that wounds Raymond. Then, when he is strolling along the beach later that day, Merceau bumps into Raymond's rival again, who draws a knife, dazzling Merceau with the reflection of the sun. In the confusion, Merceau shoots the man dead and fires four more shots into his body for good measure. Unsurprisingly, Merceau is put on trial for this, but very little focus is given to the events of the crime. The prosecutor seems unconcerned with whether Merceau's victim actually meant him harm and whether this was a killing in self-defense or an aggressive crime. Instead, he focuses on Merceau's general disposition, the things that set him apart from other people. This begins with an examination of how Merceau felt about his mother's passing. The prosecutor questions why he was so unbothered by her death. He points to his nonchalance at his mother's funeral, how he offered someone a cigarette and accepted coffee, how he did not cry and didn't want to look upon his mother's body. Essentially, the prosecutor reveals just how unusually Merceau behaved and how out of step this was with the proper way of doing things. The assembled crowd seethe in their hatred for Merceau because they are convinced he is a callous and uncaring son. And in a sense, they're right. He flies in the face of their moral norms. He is strange to them. This hammers home Merceau's sense of alienation, and he even describes wanting to cry for the first time in years. This points to the fact that Merceau, despite all of his general indifference, still yearns to be understood by other people. Put a pin in that because it will become an important point. After this, his relationship with Marie is called into question. How could this man, so soon after his mother's death, begin an affair with this young lady? Where was his sense of decorum? Where was his mourning? For that matter, what was he doing striking up a friendship with Raymond? How could he justify writing a letter that would deliver a young woman to a beating? Why did he get involved in Raymond's dispute with these other men? For Merceau, the answer to these questions is obvious. It is because he did not mind either way, and so went along with whatever struck him as easiest or most interesting in the moment. His general non-committal attitude to life made him very easily swayed by external circumstances. And, as we said in the last section, his indifference allowed him to remain untouched by his mother's death, enjoy his time with Marie without becoming at all attached, and aid Raymond in his dastardly schemes, all while staying in the same calm, bland mental state state. 
While other people perceive him as a kind of malicious monster, able to kill without a second thought and hating the world, he ultimately just lives an existence so alien to the people of French Algiers that what mattered to them simply struck him as pointless. They may condemn him and they may kill him, but are they justified in judging him by standards that strike him as completely absurd? Merceau doesn't even seem to understand why they're interested in his behaviour at all. At the end of the trial, the prosecutor describes Merceau's philosophical outlook as an abyss threatening to swallow up society. And I think this is a really important point. The jurors and the assembled public are less concerned with what Merceau has done and more threatened by his outlook. This is not entirely irrational of them. We all might have good reason to fear someone who does not care about their fellow man or morality. But at the same time, I think there is something deeper going on. Merceau, by his very existence, is posing them a question they simply don't want to confront. What if we truly do live in a world devoid of meaning, waiting to devour us at the point of death? What if indifference is the sole sensible position and we only continue to care about anything because of our inability to look facts in the face? Once again, Merceau is alienated by his philosophy because of what it unwittingly forces on other people. And as Jean-Paul Sartre points out in his famous essay On the Stranger, the reader is not exempt from this analysis. Although many will relate to Merceau's sense of alienation from the world and perhaps even sympathise with his devaluation of social norms, not many people are going to find his complete apathy towards the fact that he has killed a man particularly charming, nor his willingness to aid Raymond in his plot to violently harm a young woman. In presenting us with someone so at odds with our own worldview, Camus is asking us a question as well. Can we truly cope with an absurd man, someone who does not discriminate between different experiences and who thinks that any life is as good as any other, who is able to look at the emptiness of existence without flinching and lives their life accordingly? Or do we just see a dire threat to our way of life? In some ways, the reaction of the crowd and the reader to Merceau is the same reaction many of us have towards this concept of meaninglessness. Many of us find the idea that nothing matters repugnant, and since Merceau is this concept personified, we find him slightly disgusting as well. But Camus forces us to ask why this is, and he questions whether our judgment truly comes from a place of philosophical and moral concern and consistency, or whether it simply stems from our own fear. And maybe some of us can relate to Merceau's plight. Maybe we have properties or hold certain positions that are out of step with the moral system we happen to live in. Perhaps we are an atheist in a deeply religious community, or a maligned religious sect. If so, we may be used to the idea that we are a threat to the moral order and should be dispensed with forthwith. I've said this before, but one of the great strengths of Camus' writings is that he is able to show us people who are truly beyond good and evil, and challenge us to react to them in an honest and authentic fashion. How do we respond when the absurd is thrust in our face, and how should we respond? But the hatred Merceau receives at the hands of his jury is partly due to a near-universal human phenomenon, and one we might have good reason to be scared of. 3. Confusion and Chaos Perhaps one of the deepest human fears is the fear of the unknown. Even our terror at the concept of death is partly because we don't know what happens to us afterwards. Hence why the notion of an afterlife can bring some people great peace in their final days. Humanity is adept at conquering those aspects of the world we cannot yet make sense of. This is something religion, science, philosophy, art, and more all have in common. They are often trying to make something we currently find incomprehensible that bit more understandable either by crafting empirical theories or mathematical models, or by communicating a message in a particular way. And Camus' novel illustrates just how disturbing it can be when we are confronted with something we just cannot get our heads around. As I said before, throughout all the interrogations and trials, the people examining Merceau show very little interest in his actual crime. They seem untroubled by the mere fact that he has killed a man and possibly done so in cold blood. Instead, they are constantly searching for a way to make sense of him, to slot him neatly into their worldview. They cannot understand his outlook, and the mystery of this is what terrifies them most of all. First, there is the magistrate, who talks to Merceau when he is brought in for questioning. He is fascinated by the fact Merceau does not believe in God, but even more so that he treats the whole proposition with total indifference. 
The magistrate just cannot understand why someone could not be at all concerned with the matters of the divine, talking about it in the same tone of voice as you might wonder what you were going to have for breakfast. Even an atheist might recognize that the question of God's existence is an important one. But Merceau is different. He is just unbothered. This incomprehensibility is furthered when Merceau is asked why he left a gap between his first shot and his later shots. This is a perfectly sensible question to ask. It may hint that Merceau truly did want the man dead, whether or not he was initially acting in self-defense. You can imagine the kind of answers the magistrate might expect. Merceau might have claimed that the man was getting up to attack him, or that he wasn't sure that he had been neutralized as a threat. But Merceau just seems genuinely perplexed by the question, answering only that he doesn't know. The shots are an insoluble mystery even to the man who was wielding the gun. The magistrate's confusion at Merceau's behavior causes him to treat Merceau with a mixture of anger and disgust. He says he has never known someone to be so unaffected by the image of Christ's suffering, or to be so eerily calm about this whole event. He might be able to deal with criminals both rebellious and repentant, but this bizarre detachment was too foreign, too alien to him. He eventually decides to call Merceau Monsieur Antichrist, a fitting name that denotes the magistrate's opinion of him, a monster not quite of this world, yet deceptively in human form. This theme of confusion leading to condemnation and judgment becomes even more pointed during Merceau's trial, where his silence and indifference make him appear strange to the jury and the crowd. Again, no one seems interested in the fact that Merceau has actually killed a man. They do not dwell on the suffering of the victim or how it has affected his family. They essentially do not care about the crime at all, but only the unique questions Merceau poses. They want to make sense of him, to find out what makes him tick. They want to conquer this little slice of the unknown that terrifies them so much. Of course, the largely indifferent Merceau can only explain his actions in ways that are totally unsatisfactory. In response to the question of why he shot his victim, he says it was because of the sun. And he is being perfectly honest here. The sun blinded him, making him confused, and he only ever moved towards the man because he felt the sun's heat on his back and was trying to escape it. Merceau's movements were not dictated by a reasoned will, but rather by these vague animalistic impulses. But of course, the jury only laughs off this answer. They want to know what reasons and values led Merceau to committing this crime, and he simply has no answer. A large part of why the prosecutor deems Merceau this grave philosophical threat to society, and why he eventually asks for the death penalty, is because of this intense confusion everybody feels towards him. He is an unknown element, something so strange he is difficult to look at. They do not know what he will do next, or what he values, or what motivates his actions. They cannot change him, and they cannot make sense of him so they consign him to the flames, sentencing him to the guillotine. And this confusion is shared by Merceau. Just like the jury cannot make sense of his indifference, he can't understand why they behave in certain ways. He does not get why he should have been more upset by his mother's death, nor why his behaviour with Marie is deemed inappropriate. Their morals are as strange to him as his lack of morals are to us. This shared bewilderment opens an unbridgeable chasm between Merceau and the rest of mankind, and it eventually breaks out into hostility. Hence, he is sentenced to death. First, it is worth noting that Merceau's strangeness is just an extreme form of the way we are all somewhat alien to one another. Sure, we may in fact share values, experiences and memories with others, but there is always the barrier of people's skulls preventing us from fully knowing what's going on in their mind. The paranoia the crowd have about Merceau's psychology is a heightened version of an unease we can all feel when we recognize how much of other people's minds are forever barred off to us. Our best friend could secretly hate us, our partner could be cheating on us, and anyone at any moment could embark on a course of action that we would find totally confusing and incomprehensible. All because of this unbridgeable gap between our consciousness and the consciousness of everyone around us. We are all strangers, just not to the same extent. Merceau refuses to make himself even a little bit understandable to others, and it throws people into a violent frenzy. They hate him far more than he ever hated the man he killed. It is a stark reminder of how vicious humans can be when they encounter the unknown. And since we are all, to a certain extent, unknown to one another, this leaves a bitter taste in our mouths. How would people react, we might think, if they knew what I was really like?
The desperate search for a theory to explain Merceau's behaviour also serves as an analogy for how we encounter the absurd. We want the universe to be understandable like a rational human agent. We want it to have concepts like good and evil and to be interested in us in some way. But it does not and is not, and many of us find this idea unbearable. We might be able to cope with a universe that hated us, but one that does not know we exist and cannot understand us is so terrifyingly bland that it can throw us into a crisis. In classic fashion, Camus manages to comment both on our interpersonal alienation and our existential isolation in a single literary masterstroke. It is no wonder that this has gone down as one of the richest philosophical novels in history. But finally, I want to explore how Merceau learns to deal with this alienation. How he transforms the world from something he is simply indifferent to into his dear friend, without abandoning his philosophical principle that nothing really matters. 4. The Comfort of the Absurd for many people, the idea that the universe is indifferent to us can seem distressing. Merceau's attitude of total apathy towards the world can come across as incredibly bleak, and sometimes the line between absurdism and nihilism seems very thin. But in the final chapter of the book, where Merceau is awaiting his execution, we see him undergo a philosophical breakthrough. In a lot of other stories not written by Camus, this would be where Merceau learns the error of his ways, rejecting his prior indifference and deciding that morality, love and family are truly worth something. But of course, this book is written by Camus. And so Merceau does remain indifferent and alienated, but at the same time manages to make peace with this fact. His revelation is sparked by a conversation with the prison chaplain. Just like everybody else, he finds Merceau's outlook strange and absurd. The chaplain refuses to accept that Merceau is different and that he truly does not see the value in the prospect of higher meaning or an afterlife or anything else for that matter. Eventually, Merceau becomes enraged by the priest's refusal to even try to see his point of view and throws him out of the cell. There is no one who seems to understand Merceau, no matter how hard he tries to get his point across. It is simply beyond their limits to see him as anything other than a weird anomaly, a human defect, a philosophical abomination. He shouts at the priest that he means exactly what he says, that nothing matters and he does not see why he should care about any of it. Merceau seems relieved by this outburst, and when he settles back into bed, he realises that there is something similar to him. And that is the universe itself. His outlook is simply a reflection of the world's indifference, and as long as this remains the case, he is not truly alone. He may be a stranger to everyone else, but to the cosmos he is perhaps the most sensible person on the planet. In that moment, he no longer feels like he is kicking against hostile and vengeful crowds, but instead sees them for what they are. Future corpses, shouting at nothing, amounting to nothing, signifying nothing. In his own words, I opened myself to the gentle indifference of the world, finding it so much like myself, so like a brother really. I felt I had been happy and that I was happy again. As is often the case with Camus, this passage communicates two thoughts simultaneously. The first is that Merceau has now fully accepted the meaninglessness of the universe. He is no longer troubled by the absurd in the slightest and has moved past it, finding happiness in indifference rather than just indifference. But for the first time in the novel, he has also ceased to be a stranger. For the rest of the book, Merceau is constantly in contrast with people that are fundamentally opposed to his worldview. Marie wants him to notice the value in her love, Raymond wants him to be alive to his anger, and the courts want him to recognise that he should have mourned his mother. Everywhere he has turned, Merceau has found opposition and condemnation. He has been made strange. But it is in these final moments, awaiting his execution, that he finally discovers a friend. He may be alien to everyone else, but he is at peace with himself and with the world as it appears to him. Just as absurdism is coming to terms with the universe's meaninglessness rather than attempting to inject meaning into it, Merceau transcends the need to have others accept him or even understand him. He has embraced his position as an outsider and has found satisfaction in it. At the philosophical level, he is able to live with meaninglessness, and at the everyday level, he has made sense of his position as isolated, alone, and resented. The only thing he wishes is for there to be a large crowd of braying, hating people at his execution.
And this is emblematic of a theme that will only become more prominent in Camus' later works like The Rebel and The Fall. The problem of existential meaning and how to move past the absurd is inexorably tied up with our own everyday problems of cruelty, violence, political struggle, isolation, social unrest and morality. It is all considered part of one enormous thorny problem. In The Stranger, Camus ties together the issues of being alone, isolated and judged and the problem of an indifferent universe and paints a form of absurdism as the answer both to the larger philosophical concern but also to the very real and concrete issue of when we feel unbearably alone. Paradoxically, just as we can imagine Sisyphus happy in his pointless task, the universe itself becomes Merceau's companion. Its indifference becomes not crushing but comforting. And we move through the problem of our incomprehensible isolation rather than running from it or rejecting it. And this, for me, is what makes The Stranger one of the most exciting and insightful examinations of what it means to be alone in all literature. It paints isolation not just as a problem of the person or of society or of psychology, but one that cuts at the deepest level of our fundamental philosophy. And I hope this video has encouraged you to give it a read. But if you want more on the way Camus meshes absurdism with more everyday problems, then click here to see how he approaches the topic of guilt and shame from the standpoint of the absurd. It's also perhaps one of the most terrifying books I've ever read, so there's that. And stick around for more on thinking to improve your life.